So I come from ENS, uh, from an experimental group. So this is this is our group. We have actually three experiments, uh, more or less running. And the one I will be telling you about is the one working on a mixture of lithium-6 and lithium-7. So these are two isotopes of lithium. One is a boson, lithium-7, and the other one is a fermion, lithium-6. And you can see immediately the difference uh, between the two species by the signature of very different uh, quantum statistics. Here the bosons display a very sharp peak which heralds the presence of the bose einstein condensates, where you see here that there is no such features in the cloud of, of fermions. So this machine is a wonderful uh, setup to uh, explore all kinds of different physics. And for instance, in the context of poron physics, you can take, okay, let, let's, let's take the bose einstein condensate and let's put a few fermions inside the bose einstein condensate. In this case, you realize a system which is called the bose polaron, uh, which is very similar to, to what you have in condensed matter, where the impurity dresses with a cloud of uh, phonons, which are the uh, low-lying excitations of a bose einstein condensate. So I will not discuss very much this, this topic, because it will be the, the subject of uh, Jan Hart's uh, talk right after mine. Now you can do the opposite and say, okay, let's take the Fermi cloud and let's put a bosonic impurity inside the Fermi cloud, or any kind of impurity. In this case, you realize what is called a uh, Fermi polaron, and in its simplest instance, uh, if you consider a spin polarized uh, gas of, uh, of fermions, at low temperature, in the ultra-cold regime, where the range of interactions is much smaller than the double wavelength, you can prove that there is no interactions between uh, atoms with identical spins. And so essentially, the impurity is immersed in an ideal Fermi gas. And uh, in this case, it will uh, create a cloud of particle hole excitations. And so this has been uh, the topic of, a, uh, of extensive uh, studies uh, around 2010, so 10 years ago. And now I would like to uh, discuss an extension uh, of this problem where we consider a uh, Fermi cloud with two spin components, so spin up and spin down. In this case, Pauli principle will not prevent any more interactions, and we can achieve a, uh, a cloud of fermions which is strongly interacting. And so this is what I would like to, to study today, or to discuss today. This is the interaction of a polaron with a, a very strongly uh, correlated medium. So before starting, I would just like to, to make a, a very brief uh, recap about the uh, general properties of ultra-cold atom, which can be quite different from what we have in, uh, let's say, standard condensed matter. So I already mentioned this, this point, but this is very important, uh, which is the fact that uh, we work in the ultra-cold regime, so where uh, we have short-run interactions and work in the ultra-cold regime where the wavelength of the uh, matter waves is much la larger than the range of interactions. And so one of the consequences uh, I mentioned is the fact that if you consider spin polarized fermions, Pauli principle will prevent two fermions to be sitting at the same place, and so will kill essentially interactions because they are short range. Now, uh, as I said, uh, if you uh, add, uh, if you have spin one of fermions, you can have attraction now, uh, interactions, and um, this uh, will lead to a, uh, a very rich phase diagram, which is called the BEC-BCS crossover, where essentially the fermions will pair up uh, to form pairs. They can be loosely bound or tightly bound, depending on the strength of the interactions. But in any case, these pairs will lead you to a superfluid phase, which is very similar, uh, depending on the interaction regime, to uh, the BCS superfluidity in superconductors or a bose einstein condensate uh, of very strongly dimers. So this is usually represented by this diagram here, where we plot the interaction strength in this direction. So in the strongly attractive regime, you form very uh, strongly bound pairs which you can consider as point-like bosons. And so in this regime, you have a, um, a bose einstein condensate of dimers. And, uh, and on the opposite uh, side, you have very loosely uh, Cooper pairs, uh, which can also form, as I said, a, uh, a BCS superfluid. And actually, the regime which is interesting is the one which is in between, where the size of the pairs is comparable with the interparticle distance. And this is a regime which is very strongly correlated and which is the most difficult to address uh, theoretically. And so this is the one usually uh, on this one that we, that we focus. Okay, so um, one of the unique features of cold atoms is the fact that we can, but that interactions are very simple due to these uh, short range limits and that we can control these, these interactions. Uh, 
So, uh, in a nutshell, um, if you work in this regime where the, the double wavelength is much larger than the range of the potential, if you describe the scattering of two particles quantum mechanically, you have essentially uh, an incoming wave, a scattered wave, and uh, what you say that as usual in diffraction, uh, since the wavelength is very large, you will not resolve the details of the, uh, of the potential. And so in this limit, you can say, okay, let's forget about all the details of the potential, and let's assume that you, we have really a zero range uh, potential. And so to characterize these zero range potential is a, bit, uh, is a bit tricky because, for instance, if you take just a Dirac potential in 3D, it's highly singular and you have to renormalize it. Uh, so if you are very pragmatic, you say, okay, let's look at the scattering uh, wave function. So you have the incoming wave function, some scattering wave function, which is characterized by some spherical wave and some amplitude. And uh, this uh, amplitude depends on the uh, incoming energy. And since we work at low energy, we're going to replace this scattering amplitude by uh, its zero energy value. And so this value, minus f of zero, actually, is called the scattering length. So this scattering length uh, will characterize the scattering properties of two particles at, at low energy. Um, and so the idea is to take your very complex interactomic potential that includes all the uh, very nasty molecular physics uh, that you expect in this, kind, in this kind of problem and uh, replace it by any kind of potential you wish. So renormalized delta, uh, some uh, beta pyros boundary condition, whatever you want, as long as at the end you get exactly the same uh, scattering length. And so uh, underlying almost all our works and the almost is important, you will see in, at the end of my talk and Jan's talk, uh, is this uh, universality hypothesis, which is that this um, replacement that we do in the two-body problem, so we say, okay, I replace my true potential by a simpler potential with the same scattering length, will also work in the many-body context, meaning that uh, if I re make this replacement for the real Hamiltonian, I will get the correct result when the range of the interactions is uh, vanishingly small. And this is really not obvious. This is really not obvious. This is, by def if this works by definition for a two-body problem, but it's not obvious that we can um, change, uh, is, this will also work for a many-body problem. So what is nice here is that in the end, all the, uh, all the interaction effects can be encapsulated in this scattering length. So this is the only parameter that you need to, uh, to control. And so, uh, what you can show is that uh, you can actually tune the value of the scattering length using a uh, magnetic field using what is called the feshback resonance, uh, where here you see the value of the scattering length for lithium-6 uh, as a function of magnetic field, and you see that there is a very nice and broad uh, resonance here where the uh, scattering length goes to infinity and changes size, so you can have positive and negative uh, size. And so, as I said, uh, this is equivalent with controlling the interactions. And so you can show that actually if you, if you can map this graph onto the BCBCS crossover uh, picture I've shown you in the previous slide. And so the, the BCS side corresponds to the negative side of the resonance where the um, scattering length is negative and small. The BC side uh, corresponds to the side of the resonance where the scattering length is positive and small. And actually, you can see that from the existence of a two-body bound state in this region. So when the scattering length is positive, you have a two-body bound state whose energy is given by min minus h bar squared divided, divided by ma squared. And this strongly correlated regime corresponded to uh, this uh, region here where the scattering length becomes very large, infinite at the limit, uh, that we call also the unitary limit. So this is for uh, the broad picture. And so uh, this is a very uh, sketch sketchy uh, description of the history of the polarons in, uh, in cold atoms. So it started, as I said, with a Fermi polaron and Bose polaron physics. And essentially, you can characterize uh, these uh, early experiments as describing an impurity which is immersed in a very simple uh, background, in the sense that the uh, Fermi C was made of spin polarized atoms, so an ideal Fermi gas while the bosons were, could be described by a, essentially a uh, mean field boson chain condensate. So we have a weakly interacting, weakly correlated medium, uh, and we put an impurity that may strongly interact with the medium. So we are on the weakly interacting side for the medium, but we can have impurities which are very strongly coupled. coupled. So as I said, in our system, we have a Fermi cloud, we can create a superfluid of fermions, and we can put uh, bosonic impurities inside this Fermi cloud. And so if you look 
at the dependence of the scaling length of the different species as a function of magnetic field. This is what you have here. So uh, here you recognize, once again in red, the broad feshbach resonance at 830 gauss for the fermions. So you have some feshbach resonances for the bosons, which, do not, we, which we don't care about much, let's say. And what is very important for our purpose, the, here you have the dashed line correspond to the scattering length between the bosons and the fermions. And you see that this scattering length is quite small, 40 bore radii, and uh, is also constant over the range where we, we, we work usually. And so it means that our experiments, where we will uh, dip this impurity inside a strongly coated medium, will essentially describe a weakly interacting impurity immersed in a very strongly interacting medium. So, the experiment I will describe work in, in this regime here. Okay, so uh, first thing you, uh, you need to, to check when you perform a uh, mixture, of, uh, when you realize a mixture of atoms, is to check whether your system uh, lives long. Because um, you may or may not know that all cold atom experiments are actually uh, metastable systems, because at these very low temperatures, the system wants to form a, a solid, not, doesn't want to stay gas, and the formation of the solid um, proceeds through the formation of molecules. And these molecules are created through three-body losses, three-body collisions. You cannot form molecules just with two particles, just due to momentum and energy conservations. And so you always have uh, background three-body losses, and if these losses are strong, uh, they may limit the, uh, the lifetime of your system and uh, forbids you from doing any kind of relevant experiment. And it's not so obvious when you increase the rate of uh, scattering, when you go into the strongly correlated regime, that these, um, the, 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 the rate of formation of molecule will stay uh, bounded. So this is uh, the first question. So how, does, how long does the mixture live? So actually, it has been studied in the past in the context of three-body physics. So it's, you look at the three-body collision between a spin-up and spin-down and, and a boson. And uh, people have isolated essentially two different regimes. So depending on whether you're on the BCS side on, or BC, BCS side or BEC side. So as I said, uh, when you're on the BCS side, the, the Cooper pairs are very loosely bound. And essentially, just like in BCS theory, your fermions behave mostly like uh, free fermions. And so here you expect a uh, real three-body collision between one boson, one spin-up, and one spin-down that will form one of these uh, deeply bound molecules that I was mentioning. So just like in chemistry, the, the probability of a uh, boson uh, to uh, encounter a spin-up and a spin-down will be proportional to the density of the two uh, components, which are equal in our case. We take the same number of spin-up and spin-down. And so you expect a loss rate for the bosons uh, to be proportional to the density square of fermions and it should go to zero uh, when you go very far away because you kill all interactions, and so uh, it can be shown uh, that it scales like a, the, the fermion fermion scaling length to the square. When f, f is equal to zero, you don't have any interaction at all between the fermions. Now, now if you go in the opposite limit, uh, as I said, the, the elementary objects of your system are now these deeply bound molecules. And so you can have a collision between a boson and a molecule. And this, even if this is a uh, two-body collision between a molecule and an atom, this is nevertheless a three-body event, because inside the molecule there are two fermions. And so a collision between a boson and a molecule can trigger the formation of one of these deeply bound molecules and can trigger uh, a loss event. And so in this case, uh, even though the, at the microscopic level, uh, losses are indeed three-body. At the more macroscopic level, uh, at the coarse grain level, uh, you, you have two-body collisions between a boson and a molecule. So you expect a loss rate for the boson to be proportional to the density of fermions or bosons, which are the same up to factor two, and times a factor uh, that will essentially describe the front condon overlap between the shallow molecule uh, that I have in my uh, boson chain condensate of molecules and the deeply bound molecule that I form after the collisions. And so uh, you can show that the size of the molecule is proportional to the scattering length, so this explains to you the presence of this 1 over AFF. So when you go very, very far away from the feshback resonance, the molecules, the, the feshback molecules becomes uh, smaller and smaller, and so their overlap with the deeply bound molecule uh, becomes better and better, and so that's why the, the loss rate increases. And so you see, 
uh, the, the, the question of the crossover between the BEC and BCS for the losses is not so obvious because what you, you, go, you, you have to go from two body to three body and so what do you expect in between? A sum of two body and three body is something more complicated. So how does it work? And so this is something that we wanted to, to explore. And so actually the, the answer was uh, pretty simple in some sense. Uh, because uh, as we said, the probability of forming a molecule is proportional to the probability of having three particles, a spin up and spin down in a, bo in a boson at very short distance. So you, you need to look at uh, the three body uh, probability distribution, row of R up, R down. And actually, so since we're working with a weakly interacting impur impurity, we can decouple this, this uh, three body uh, distribution into a part which describes the very strongly correlated medium times the density of bosons. And so all the information is actually in this two body, um, two body distribution. And so what is very nice, and we're very lucky, uh, is that uh, Shin, uh, yeah, Shin, uh, Shinatan actually found uh, the, uh, the exact properties of this quantity here. What he showed was that uh, when you have zero range or very short range interaction, actually this correlation function here scales like a constant, which is called the TANS contact parameter, divided by one over the relative distance square of the particle. So you see that there is some clustering uh, of the two particles because this correlation function diverges when the distance between them is, um, is very small. And so we can plug that into this expression, integrate over the volume of the molecule that you want to form, and what you see very simply is that uh, the loss rate should be proportional to this contact. And so now we need to know what is the value of the contact, so what is, uh, how can we characterize the short range correlations of this strongly correlated Fermi gas. So what uh, Tan uh, also showed was that uh, this contact parameter that describes short range correlations in your system also describes some of its macroscopic properties. He proved this, the so-called adiabatic sweep theorem, which relates the contact parameter with the derivative of the energy of your system with the respect with one over EFF, the uh, fermion fermion scatter length. And so this allows you to recover the different uh, regimes I've, uh, I've discussed in the previous slide. For instance, if you work in the BEC limit, if you remember, the, in the BEC limit, we have formed a bose einstein condensate of molecules. So to the leading order, the energy of the system is dominated by the binding energy of the molecules. And so you have this uh, term here plus some mean field correction. And so if you uh, differentiate the energy with respect to uh, one over AFF, the leading order term is this, and you recover a contact which is proportional to density divided by one over AFF, which is what I was uh, explaining in the previous slide. Now, if I go in the opposite uh, limit, BCS, uh, in this case, you have essentially an ideal gas plus some mean field correction. So now if you differentiate with respect to AFF, so GFF is some coupling constant which is proportional to AFF. If you differentiate with respect to AFF, you get something which is proportional to the density square times AFF square. And so once again, you recover the result that was obtained from few body physics, from the three body problem. And now when you go in between, um, so the, uh, the scanner length becomes infinite. And so uh, by a very general uh, dimensional argument, you can show that the contact is actually just proportional to the density to the four third times some factor, which is just a numerical factor that has been measured, calculated, so now its value is thought to be 0 0.87. But what is quite remarkable is that now the contact is scaled at like n to the four third. So it's not n, it's not n squared, it's n to the fourth. Third. So you have a very uh, peculiar scaling laws for the losses, which is in bet between the two body and three body losses. You could call this a two one third body losses. And this is a signature of the fact that your uh, medium uh, is now very strongly correlated and you cannot really uh, isolate very simple um, uh, elementary constituents, atoms or molecules. Okay, so we, we tried to, uh, to check this uh, experimentally, so we simply measured the loss rate uh, of our system. So in the BEC side uh, of the flashback crescent, we could check that there was indeed some 1 over AFF uh, dependence. And uh, this allowed us to, uh, to calibrate the um, proportionally constant between the contact and uh, the loss rate. And then using uh, this, uh, this proportionality constant, we could check our prediction at the inter limit. And so this is the 
uh, loss rate as a function of density, so when the scaling length between the fermions is infinite, so right on the inter limit, and uh, the points correspond to um, our measurements, and the red line correspond to uh, the prediction of our model using the value of the contact parameters and our calibration constant that we, uh, that we measured previously. And so you see that there is a very good agreement between, between both of them. So that's for the first uh, part. Now the second experiment, now we, that we know that we can make experiment, that the lifetime is not uh, uh, crazily, uh, crazily short, we can try to do some, uh, some experiments about uh, our impurity. And so what we did was to look at the dynamics of the impurity in the, uh, in the superfluid of fermions. So the experiment is very simple. So these atoms live in a harmonic trap. Actually, the, the bosons and the fermions feel exactly the same trap. And so here you have a cloud of uh, fermions, which is much bigger than the cloud of bosons, because the bosons are impurity. And what we did was to shift the two clouds by some distance, and then release them. So uh, they live in the same trap, so there's the same restoring force, but they don't have the same masses. We have lithium-7 and lithium-6. And so you see that uh, after a few oscillations, the two uh, components dephase, uh, just because we have this growth of uh, 7 over 6, which correspond to the mass ratios of the two species. So if you take uh, the two species independently, so you take only the fermions and only the bosons, you see that indeed the, the oscillation frequencies are slightly different, and their ratio is indeed in this ratio, a square of 7 over 6, uh, which is what you expect just with the mass differences. So this is when you do the experiment with the two independently. Now, if you put the two species in, uh, together in the same trap, this is what you obtain. You see that the uh, frequency of the fermions is not really affected, which is normal. It's a very big, fat trap, and you just sprinkle a few bosons. So there's no reason it should be affected. But now you see that there is a slight shift uh, downwards uh, from the frequency of the bosons, and so which is a consequence of the, uh, of the interaction between the bosons and the fermions. And so to, to understand that, um, again, since we uh, are in a, uh, in a weakly interacting uh, system, we can describe the interaction between the bosons and the fermions using some mean field approximation. So if you look at uh, bosons and you uh, ask yourself what is the uh, interacting potential felt by the, uh, by the boson, by the impurity, it's simply the sum of the trapping potential, V of R, plus a mean field contribution, which is proportional to a complete constant GBF, so once again, it's proportional to the scattering length between the bosons and the fermions, times the density of the bosons, the fermions, sorry. And since we are in the trap, actually, this uh, density profile is inhomogeneous, and so will, de will depend on the local chemical potential of the, uh, of the fermions. This local chemical potential can be uh, obtained using the uh, so-called local density approximation or Thomas Fermi approximation if you work with bosons. And it tells you essentially that the local chemical potential is just a constant minus the trapping potential of the fermions. But if you remember, the fermions and the bosons live in the same trap, so it's the same V of R. So you replace, you plug this mu of R here, and if, if your oscillation uh, amplitude is very small, uh, V of R stays small, and so you can expand this with respect to V of R, and so you see that the energy felt by a boson is just a constant, which is the, the uh, energy of interaction at the top, at the center of the trap, times V of R, plus V of R times this term here. And so you see that there is a slight correction with respect to V of R. And so this correction here is proportional to the derivative of the density with respect to chemical potential, which is just the uh, compressibility of the, to some factor. And so uh, this is what we measured here. Actually, so this compressibility is well known. It's been, again, measured. It's been uh, calculated using Monte Carlo simulation. So we know it quite well as a function of the uh, uh, fermions fermion scattering length. And so uh, this is the blue line here. This is a prediction using this uh, theoretical uh, knowledge. And you see that our, um, our points fit well with the, uh, with the data. And so it means that we understand pretty well the, uh, the interaction between the uh, impurity and the, uh, the Fermi cloud. How much time do I have left? Oh, 15 minutes. Including questions, I guess. Yes. OK. <laughs> Great. OK. So that was kind of easy because, as I said, um, now we know very well, uh, after 10 years of working on, on this system, the, the properties of the, of the background of the Fermionic superfluid. Uh, 
uh, and the impurity is quite quickly interacting. And so now the question is, can we go beyond that and uh, study the behavior of uh, essentially a strongly interacting impurity coupled, or an impurity strongly coupled to a strongly correlated medium. So go in this region of the phase diagram. So uh, this is only the beginning of the journey, so uh, we'll not be able to show you uh, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of results, but um, the, the very important message is that when you go in this direction, the universality hypothesis I was referring to at the beginning of my, of my presentation breaks down. And uh, this, is, uh, this comes from a, a phenomenon that has been discussed in, in one of the talks yesterday, which is ephemeral physics. So ephemeral physics uh, was introduced uh, in the 1970s by uh, Mr. Vitaly Efimov. Uh, at the time, he was studying the uh, physics of three bosons. And he showed that, uh, on a mathematical point of view, the zero range limit of this problem is not well defined. And uh, he, to, to, to get some mathematically meaningful results, he had to introduce a new length scale, which is called the three-body parameter, uh, which itself uh, gave rise to a series of uh, universal trimers, which are now called the Efimov trimers. But let's forget about the trimers uh, for the moment. The, the bottom line here is that in this regime, for th when you consider the three boson problem, you cannot describe all the physics only using the scalar length. You need an additional parameter, which is this three-body parameter. So there is a breakdown of the universality hypothesis when you're dealing with three, four, five, any number of bosons. And so uh, in our case, uh, when you deal with, uh, with an impurity uh, immersed in a, uh, uh, a gas of, um, of uh, spin one-half fermions, you have three species, the boson, the, uh, the spin-up, and the spin-down. And so even if these particles are not bosons, uh, nothing prevents them from occupying bosonic states, where their wave function is symmetric. And so they will, uh, they, they will feel this, this FM of physics. So FM of physics will apply to, to them, and so you won't be able to, uh, to you, you don't expect universality to work for this system when you go in the strongly correlated regime. So it is the following thing. So if I look very, uh, Okay, gives a very sketchy description of, of our phase diagram. Uh, this is what we expect. So here I'm, I'm changing the impurity fermion scalar length. So here I have the weakly attractive impurity. Here I have a strongly attractive impurity. So this is what I would call the attractive polaron. So uh, my impurity interacts with the pairs. So the, I have my Cooper pairs of uh, molecules, depending on what is the strength of interaction between the, the fermions. As we said, when the scalar length is positive, you can form a, uh, a bound state. So the impurity can bind with a, uh, a fermion. And so you have, in this case, a competition between the formation of this impurity, uh, dimer, uh, impurity fermion uh, dimer and the dimer-dimer uh, uh, binding. So you have something like this. Uh, and so here you, you see you have form a bound state between the impurity and the fermion, and one of the fermions spin down, let's say, is left alone. So we call this state a dimer run, so it's a dimer which is immersed in this strongly correlated medium. But now, as I said, you have also the possibility of forming these FM of trimers. So you expect also to have a regime where uh, this impurity will bind directly with a Cooper pair or a molecule to form a trimer, an FM of trimer. And so you have this branch here. And so actually, so uh, the ground state of this impurity will be described by this uh, transition between the polar one and the trimer run, and then uh, to the uh, dimer run. It's thought that actually this transition here is uh, just a crossover because it corresponds just to the uh, gradual attraction between the impurity and, and the dimer. So um, we did a very simple uh, phase, we drew a very simple phase diagram for, for this system using the fact that usually this uh, three-body parameter that sets the scale of the FM of trimers is a very, very small length scale. And so the energy that it introduces is very large compared to all other uh, energy scales. And so uh, this is the kind of phase diagram that you, that you expect. Uh, so here you have uh, the BC to BCS crossover because you vary the fermion fermion scalar length, and there you have the impurity fermion scalar length. So in this regime, the impurity is very weakly interacting, so we have a polaron, 
And this poloron will interpolate between the Fermi poloron and the Bose poloron, in the sense that when we go in this direction, we explore the BC to BCS crossover. So here the fermions are weakly interacting, so we have essentially a Fermi C of non-interacting fermions, so this is indeed a Fermi polaron. And the other side, uh, the superfluid is described by a superfluid of very tightly bound molecules, so bosons, and so this is actually a Bose polaron. And uh, then if you go in this direction, you cross, you go to the trimeron, and then you form the dimeron. So this is essentially the phase diagram that you expect. And so, to make a long story short, we've been able to, to calculate the, the beyond mean field corrections for this, uh, this polaron, so in, in this region here. And what we could show was that the energy of the polaron is proportional to the uh, mean field uh, term that I discussed in the oscillation um, in the oscillation experiment, plus a beyond mean field term, which includes two terms. So this F here, which is a, a universal term that depends only on the fermion fermion scalar length, that we can also relate to the uh, compressibility of the Fermi gas. And this term, which is not universal in the sense that it uh, includes, it, it incorporates explicitly three-body physics, so you need to uh, incorporate a new ingredient. That depend, it does not only depend on the scalar length, and which is characterized by, by this logarithmic divergence. And uh, once again, you, you see here that you have tense contact uh, that appears, and this function here is some function that depends on the mass ratio between the impurity and the, um, and the fermions. And so now the, the, the plan would be to, to fill these dots here to go even further in this, uh, in this region. So that's the end of my talk. Um, just a uh, take home message. <laughs> Is the, 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 from the first two sections is the fact that these impurity problems are interesting per se, but can also be used as probe of a many-body environment. As I said, if you look at losses, you have access to this contact parameter, which is very important to describe uh, the short-range correlations of your system. If you uh, look at the oscillation frequency of your impurity, uh, you have access to the compressibility of the many-body uh, background. And uh, as I've shown you, these experiments rely on very, very weak hypotheses. So I think they are a very powerful tool to probe a many-body environment. Uh, now, as I said, the, the current challenge, uh, for us at least, is to try to push further in the strongly correlated regime. And both theoretically, to try to, uh, to, to get the beyond mutual correction and to, to study this crossover between the pollen and trimeron, but also experimentally, to try to be able to test uh, these, uh, these predictions. And for instance, uh, just to, to finish, uh, when I've shown you uh, the, the comparison between the experiment and, um, and theory for the oscillation frequency, I mentioned the, the dots here, which come from our experiment, but there's also the little triangle here, uh, which is an experiment from MIT. And you see that there is very small discrepancy um, between our measurement the, uh, and the, the result from MIT. And it might be, unfortunately, this is within the error bar, but it might be a uh, first signature of this beyond mean field correction, the fact that uh, actually the, the, the blue dot that uses the mean field approximation does not really agree with the triangle, uh, which, is, uh, which uses the, 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 the real equation of state for, for the, the system. So there might be something to explore in this little discrepancy here um, that we'll look more carefully in the future. Thank you. Thank you very for a nice talk. Now we have uh, time to questions for questions. So, uh, what would be an experimental signal of transiting from the Polaron regime to the Trimeron uh, regime? Um, it, so, it, there, there could be some. Uh, if you look at the um, the. The spectral function, uh, when you are in the Polaron regime, you, are, uh, you have a peak uh, which describes the fact that essentially you have a single particle. Uh, and then you see that this peak broadens uh, when you enter the trimeron regime. So by, I guess by using some R spectroscopy or RP slack uh, spectroscopy, you should see this broadening uh, and the fact that there is a crossover between the two. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Uh, I very much enjoyed seeing this phase diagram. Okay. And I was wondering whether you could bring it up again and, yeah. and maybe try to tell us where the experiments we are doing with the Bose-Polaron fall into this or whether they can be placed into this phase diagram. Uh, 
it's, it's somewhere here. Uh, so th there's a line which is important, which is the line where the, uh, the, the two scattering lengths are equal. Um, and in our case, where the, the fermic nature is important, we are uh, on this side of the line. So there's a transition, which is, and we work here, where essentially uh, we have uh, still weakly bound uh, molecule in the sense that the, uh, the size of the molecule is still larger than the, um, the range of the potential. Uh, in your case, where you have your, your bosons are real bosons, uh, the size of the molecule is essentially comparable with the range of the potential. So you, you are in this region here. So, sorry, it's, it's something like this. And so actually, we would like to, 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 to cross this threshold and, and go in your direction. Because the, the real bose polar should be somewhere in this phase diagram, yes. then uh, a priori you don't have this FM of trimers, but it's still known that if the mass of the impurity is very small compared to the fermions, you still have something similar happening. Is this something that you can explore experimentally? Uh, yes, 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 yeah, there are people trying all kind of mass ratios uh, to explore this kind of phenomenon, yes. But obviously it's not so easy experimentally because you have to re reset up the whole experiment, uh, but there are people working in this direction. More questions? So, uh, in the BCBCS crossover, uh, there's also lots of questions on the elementary excitations of the superfluid itself. Can we use the polarons to learn more about these? Uh, sort of. Um, for instance, there's an experiment I, I did not describe, uh, which was the uh, the fact that when you uh, increase the initial displacement in the oscillation experiment, uh, you see that there is a critical velocity above which you, you have some dissipation. And uh, if you believe uh, Landau's argument and these sort of things, uh, this uh, gives you information about the, uh, the excitation spectrum. So it's not the, the whole excitation spectrum, but this is related to the excitation of the, of the superfluid. More questions? Ah, okay. Uh, our next speak speaker is uh, Jan Arlt. Uh, universal dynamics of impurities in a Bose and Stein condensate. I need power as well. And there were some adapters here. Just trying to find the right adapter. This should do it. Yes, I believe so. Let me try. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with me while we were just getting this to run. And thank you to the organizers for giving me the chance to present our work, which, in line with the work that Frederic just presented, comes from a different discipline and hopefully can provide some input to your field. And I've already learned uh, a lot about your field from the past few days, and I'll be bringing that into my work uh, as well. So we're working with um, cold atomic gases uh, in the same way that Frederic does, but we are working with a bosonic gas, and therefore we call our polaron the, the Bose polaron. That is, we are immersing an impurity in a bosonic quantum gas. And um, where, whereas you treat electrons in solids, the question is how can that concept be translated to a quantum gas? Well, we actually do not have a lattice, but in fact have a gas of host atoms, our medium, and then we can uh, either immerse a different species or, in our case, just a different quantum state into that gas and call that in impurity. And the question is how do these, translates, these concepts translate into each other, and that's what I'll be discussing. The advantage of our system is obviously that we have very high purity. Um, there are no other atoms present, no defects. We have high flexibility, and that's already what Frederic outlined. We have the ability to tune the scattering length and the densities of our samples, and uh, we have tunable interactions. So that gives us this um, picture of the polaron, which uh, Frederic has already shown. We typically um, use a different notation from the one you're used to, and that is we call the x-axis here the inverse interaction strength. So that means we have on the left-hand side a, a weakly attractive situation. On the right-hand side, we have a weakly repulsive interactions, and then these interactions get stronger as we uh, go to the, uh, to the uh, center here, and uh, at the center, we call that often the uh, the, the unitary region, we have interactions as strong as quantum mechanics will permit. And that means we typically can replace our scattering length in this problem, which Frederick has also in introduced, with the, mean, with, with the interparticle spacing as the only relevant quantity. And therefore, we often call interactions at this um, uh, unitary point universal in the sense that the scattering length drops out. So that's a little bit of a different use of universality. Okay, our tuning parameter here in order to wander along the x-axis and change this, this inverse interaction strength is, um, is the magnetic field in our experiment. That means we, we change our magnetic field typically only by a few gauss at a given, at a given field and bring a molecular resonance into a, a molecular state into resonance with our atomic free states. And, and that means as soon as we come into resonance, the chance of making a collision becomes greatly enhanced, uh, and that modifies the scattering length. So as we go from left to right here, changing the mag magnetic field in our experiment, we, uh, we uh, uh, change the, uh, the, the scattering length, so the scattering probability, be it attractive or repulsive, in our experiments drastically. Okay, and, and that information now allows me to uh, go from a cartoon diagram to a realistic diagram on our expectation of what the bose polaron will look like in our systems. So uh, we have the attractive polaron branch, as shown here, and uh, the uh, repulsive polaron branch, as shown uh, on the right-hand side here. Um, typically, that attractive polaron branch um, it traverses the, the universal region here, and merges eventually, and that's also what Frederic pointed out, with a, with a bound state. So this, this red dashed line here is molecular bound states where, where two atoms are simply bound into a, a weakly bound uh, molecule. And, and, and the, the fact that these two merge together is quite obvious. If you have an attractive polaron, so you're, you're gathering, in a sense, these excitations around your impurity, eventually one of these excitations in our case, which are um, Boglubov excitations, will turn into a real particle and bind with your impurity. And that's what happens down here. 
I've also shaded the region above this line, and that's because we uh, unfortunately work in a, in, a in a magnetic or optical trap. That means we do not only have one density of particles, but we have a continuum of densities of particles. And that means we do not only have a polaron at one given density, which would correspond to the given uh, orange line, but also to all densities all the way up to zero, which leads really to a broadening um, all the way up to uh, zero energy. Similarly, the repulsive polaron here can decay into the molecule, and that's why I've given it the, the gray shading here, which, dis, which, which is to show that, that it is broadened by decay. So the work on this was um, strongly motivated by collaboration with a, a theory colleague at Aarhus, Georg Brun, who uh, in fact calculated the polaron energy in our system uh, to the next order in perturbation theory, and he derived this term here, which actually looks very close to the one that Phil Rick just presented, um, which is the, the logarithmic divergence of the uh, three-body term in the polaron energy. And it's this term that we were looking after uh, in our experiments. So wh why is it challenging, nonetheless, to observe the polaron in these uh, systems? Well, um, out here for weak interactions, be it uh, attractive or repulsive, um, the, the difference between a mean field approach and the polaron is minute. So it's hardly possible that we will see anything out here. And in the center, there is a region close to unitarity where losses are massive. Not only two atoms come together, but three atoms come in the vicinity of each other, and that's the effect that Frederick actually used. And when they do, they, they can form, um, they can form a, a bound molecule and a third atom, and both of these will then be lost from our system. And these three-body losses scale typically with A to the 4, that is shown down here as we approach from the left and the right, and that may make it very difficult to see this this, this central region here. So this is the challenge we were facing, and the question was, how wide are these, these wide regions here? Can we see the bose polaron at all in our regions, or are these white areas too small to detect anything? So, so we did the experiment, and here is how it works. In our particular case, we used potassium-39, and we used two spin states of potassium-39. And we can tune the... the, the, the the interaction strength between these two spin states with the Feshbach resonance. So all we have to do is we spin flip from our Bose condensate into, a, uh, into the, the, the second state, which then has the strong interactions. That means we go from a non-interacting to an interacting state, and we should, by measuring the uh, necessary energy to go to that state, immediately be able to see the polaroid. How are these experiments done in practice? Let me just run through that very quickly because many of you are from a, from a different field. We start um, typically over here by collecting atoms in a, in a magneto-optical trap. Um, and, uh, oops, that went somehow a little bit wrong. Let me just try to get that animation to work again. Here it is. So we collect atoms here. We bring them, whoops, to this region over here actually and then finally you transfer them into a, into a magnetic trap in this uh, far furthest corner of our, of our vacuum setup. There we transfer them from a purely magnetic container, which, which traps them due to the magnetic dipole of these, uh, at the moment of these atoms, to a, a harmonic magnetic trap, and eventually to an optical dipole trap. And in these optical dipole traps, we then have the magnetic field which we need for field tuning as a free parameter. Here, the, uh, we can make use of the, of the Feshbach resonance and the, the sort of Feshbach uh, zoo of Feshbach resonance in which we uh, can pick our, our optimal working point is shown here. Um, we uh, typically uh, work in a given state of potassium which has a positive scattering length in this valley here, and that means we can uh, make both Einstein condensates. And then we use the green Feshbach resonance shown here in order to tune the scattering length between this Bose-Einstein condensate and the impurity which we, which we immerse. And here a picture of these Bose-Einstein condensates is shown, and this will also be the way that we detect eventually the strength, uh, the energy of our polar. So how are the uh, how can we visualize uh, how the polarons are, are created in our experiment? Well, we start with the Bose condensate, which is in a pure a spin state, 
And then we tip the total spin of this system slightly. And that means we initially just make a coherent admi admixture, a superposition state of these two spin states with typically a 5% admixture. And that means our polaron really starts out being completely coherent with the background. And you could ask, and that was the important question that we, that we wanted to ask in the, in the later part of the experiment, which I'll be showing, how does the uh, coherence disappear? How does this decohere and turn into an actual polaron from this coherent admixture? And here is again the uh, involved Feschbach resonance. How do we then detect uh, the, uh, the polaron, or how do we detect the energy uh, at which we have created the polaron? Well, for once, we are aided here by three-body recommendation, because if we wait long enough, then if we have been successful at creating the polaron, it will be lost due to three-body recombination with the background gas. So essentially, we, uh, we create our admixture, we wait, for three-body collisions to take place, we then um, detect a loss of atoms. If we were able to um, create a, uh, an impurity at the given energy, and then we measure the remaining number of atoms. And that gives us a trace like this. So here is the bare transition energy of our sample. Uh, so at the, at the dashed line here, I would have just made a single atom transition from one spin state to the other. But as you can see, the actual, the actual trace, the actual spectroscopic signal is shifted slightly from that. That means we had to use excess energy in order to create the polaron. We had to give the, uh, the atom additional energy in order to go to the just state in our medium. And we translate this trace here shown in green into a color code as shown here where red then uh, corresponds to the strongest loss of atoms, the highest probability at having been able to create the polaron, and, and we, we create such a slice, and we measure these slices at all interaction energies. And that gives us the, the following result, uh, shown here on the left. Um, that's the, the experimental detection of the polaron in our system then, and you can see here that, as expected, there is a polaron state, which eventually merges across unitarity with the molecular state here, which is a difficult region to resolve. And on the other hand, we see the, uh, um, the, the attractive polaron, uh, sorry, the repulsive polaron on the positive scattering length side, which goes up, but then does not di diverge and, and shows an overlap region here with the um, repulsive polaron. And that is represented, reproduced very nicely by a, by a variational theory, and that variational theory includes um, the impurity and two additional lattice excitations. And these lattice excitations, in our case, are Boglubov excitations of the uh, superfluid gas. And you can see the nice equivalence between these two diagrams in the theory. You, just, you see the polaron as well. You see its, its uh, transition across unitarity and the merger, well, expected merger with the molecular state, and you also see the um, uh, repulsive polaron on the other side. And, and in the first analysis, it, uh, it, the first analysis showed that we have very good understanding of the um, uh, attractive polaron here in comparison with uh, a, a perturbative calculation and the variational calculation in blue. Um, and that, that it, is clearly, it clearly differs from the simple mean field result shown in green. That analysis also showed, though, that the, that the, the attractive polaron was much better understood than the repulsive polaron. For further work, it was very important to understand these um, energies in much more detail uh, than we did just in comparison with the variational theory. And, and, and this work um, is actually, uh, this work was done experimentally by creating a, a proper line shape function for the Bose polaron. So as you would normally expect for a polaron, the line shape actually consists of um, the, the quasi-particle residue, so the strong polaronic peak shown here, with a broad background due to the additional excitations we can make in our Bose gas. So those are the, the phonons, or in our case, the Boglikov excitation. And we then have to assemble many of these uh, polaron line shapes into a composite line shape given by the density of our sample, and that is, that is shown schematically here. And, and this allows us to actually fit from the, the data I previously uh, 
showed this broadened, this broadened data here, it allows us to fit the onset of the Polaron um, as, as given here. And that allowed for a direct comparison with the quantum Monte Carlo calculations, and the first author is in the, this paper is, is in the audience, this was, this was done by Lewis, who showed that, that we actually achieve very nice agreement between our, our uh, Polaron energy and uh, the quantum Monte Carlo situ uh, calculation uh, describing this Polaron. In particular, it provided us uh, with the precise value of the Polaron energy at unitarity at the case where the interactions are as, as strong as they can be. So, so this, uh, this was very nice uh, and uh, gave us a first hint at the fact that we can actually contribute to the question of the Polaron, but it left us with a problem. And the problem was that, that we use a certain pulse time in order to, to, to create the Polaron, but we don't know whether that pulse time is actually sufficiently long in order for the Polaron to evolve in the medium state. So we, we make an instantaneous uh, pulse, and if that pulse was very short, we would only be measuring the bad transition energy, which we don't. But if that pulse was too long, we would have decay. So somewhere in between lies an appropriate time for the spectroscopic experiment in order to detect the polar. And the question was, what is that time? So, so somewhere in, 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 in between here is, is the right time scale for our experiments to do for this interrogation uh, pulse. And the question is how to investigate that. And the way we in investigate that, in we investigated this, this um, uh, creation of the Bose polar, polar one, that is the decoherence that takes place from the initial pulse to a, an actual polar one in the medium was by doing uh, interferometric measurements. And this is, a, this is a Ramsey sequence which is um, maybe equivalent to, a, to a, a pulsed electron spin resonance experiment in some ways. So how do we do that? Well, we make a very short, in this case, extremely short first pulse, which tips the spin of our, uh, our sample um, slightly away from the, from the North Pole, slightly away from the spin polarized state, and typically co corresponding only to a 5% admixture. And then we allow this state to evolve. So, so it evolves here, and we, we try to visualize that, that it evolves into a very complex quantum state, which in principle is difficult to represent on, on, on such a Bloch sphere. We try to visualize here that it, it becomes broadened, smears out. At the same time, losses take place, which decrease the size of this Bloch sphere. And then after a given, uh, a given evolution time of this uh, impurity state, in doing the formation of the polaron, we probe the state, and we do that by applying a second pulse, um, RF pulse, with variable phase, uh, that is shown here, which then can rotate the state either backwards or further along the Bloch sphere. And that means we project the state of the eventual uh, um, polaron that we have formed back onto the pure state from which it came. Um, what type of signals do we get? That is shown here. So if we, <coughs> if we uh, uh, project back immediately, that means after a very short uh, period of time, 1.4 microseconds in our case, we recover the cloud completely. That means we have, we have tipped the spin, it has not had time to decohere into the polaron, and we've tipped it back, and that's when we uh, reach full uh, um, uh, visibility in our case. However, if we, if we wait a, a certain amount of time, you can see that two things have happened. The state has progressed on the Bloch sphere. It has uh, uh, picked up a, a certain phase due to the energy shift that the polaron has from the bare state, and uh, leading to a phase here. And the coherence amplitude has decreased because the, the, the state has broadened. So this is the information that we recover. We, we, uh, we, interpret this as being the coherence function, you could also think of it as the Green's function of the system, um, we recover phases and amplitudes after evolution times. And we do that for a given interaction strength. Here I show a series taken at relatively low interaction strength for many wa different waiting times, ranging here from, from one microsecond spacing where we have complete um, uh, coherence of the system to uh, about some 200 <laughs> microseconds where the state has decohered and formed 
either the polaron or just an admixture, depending on which interaction strength we now have. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so what happens? After we have done the first pulse, we have created our, at, at that case, at, at that point, coherent impurity. Uh, dynamical scattering will take place on uh, a given time scale, and I will be, be reporting these time scales, forming the, the polaron, and, and the type of uh, signals that we obtain are then shown here. Uh, as a function of time, we have a loss of coherence as shown by our data points here, and I will talk about the theoretical interpretation in a little while, and we have an advance of the phase as the state rotates around, processes around the Bloch sphere. So let's, let's first look at the, at the case of uh, weak interaction. So in the weak interactions, we can, we can apply a perturbative model um, based on the uh, model that, that I introduced in the beginning, uh, calculated by Georg. So we have some dynamical scattering processes, and Georg has calculated the time scale for these, which are given up here in the, in the exponential. In addition, we have a rotation given by the mean field energy, which is the main contribution to the rotation precession on the blos, of the phase on the Bloch sphere. Unfortunately, experimentally, this is not the only thing that happens. We also have, we also have three body loss events, and we have magnetic field drifts, which are an inherent part of, of our experiments. So we combine all these, all these effects into a, a, a single theoretical description, which is shown here. Um, in terms of the actual dynamical pro, uh, um, uh, scattering process, which is the time scale we are interested in, the trap average due to mean field effects, three body loss effects, and field fluctuations. All of these, however, are independently measured and well known such that we can actually extract the time scale given here. And that works very nicely. You can see that in the weakly interacting case, we can get a very nice agreement between our data and the full theory here, which is shown as a dot dashed green line. So that means uh, as a benchmark in the weakly interacting case, we have a good understanding of how the impurity behaves in our system um, and how it decoheres um, uh, in, in that case. Now it becomes much more interesting when we go to the, the strongly uh, interacting regime because in that case um, we actually expect the formation of a polaron which differs from the pure mean field result. <clears throat> and, and the way we can interpret this is by looking at the, at the known spectral function of the system. So, so from, from, from the scattering physics in these cold atomic clouds, one can calculate a, a spectral function, and in order to look at the time domain, we then take the Fourier transform of this spectral function, which is given here, and in this form, is rather difficult to interpret. So, so uh, rather than using that, that most general form of the, of the uh, spectral function and thereby the time evolution of the system, we can actually divide it up in different regimes. So there is a short time regime um, when t is much smaller than uh, the mass times the scattering length squared in our system where we uh, expect universal behavior. It is uh, the, the coherence function, so the amplitude and phase of this coherence is what we measure, is given here. It scales, it has a power law scaling with a power to the, uh, to the three halves. And this time scale Tn here is independent of um, any particular uh, parameters of the system. It only depends on the density. And that's why we call it universal here, using universal in a slightly different way from the way, the way you describe universality. So this is, this is the, the universal regime which happens at any interaction strength as long as the initial time is short enough. And then we have a two-body regime. So this, this time scale Tw here is actually uh, depends on the scheduling to the fourth power. So it's something that now becomes rather specific to the system that we're using, potassium-39 in our, in our particular case. And it has a power less scaling to the power one half. So, so these two regimes are quite distinct, and, and if, we can the, if we can distinguish these two, we can construct what I would call a dynamical phase diagram of the creation of the Bose polar. Okay, let's look, first look at the, at, the, at the weakly interacting regime. So now we are, we are looking at this two-body weakly interacting regime where we expect power law to the uh, one-half scale. And that's indeed what we um, observe for the 
this regime, oh, I'm, I have actually put the wrong formula up here. This put, should be the power law one half. Um, we, uh, we, that's exactly what we see for the short time evolution here. So, so if we plot, um, and this is not a fit, this is a completely fit-free plot of the result of our, our theory. If we plot that, we see that it actually agrees well in the short time domain. So that's nice. It again confirms that we understand the weakly interacting case. However, if we go to slightly stronger interactions, we now expect that we get a crossover. So, so we, uh, we, we would expect a crossover from the universal power law three half scaling to this power law one half scaling if we have a, a, a system with intermediate uh, uh, scattering length. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, interactions, uh, interaction strengths. So it's this crossover that we're looking for, which, which signals really that we go from a universal to a weakly interacting uh, regime. Can we see that in our data? Yes, we can. Again, here we have the phase this time of, uh, of our signal. So, so in a sense, we are now look, asking, looking at the question, how fast does the state rotate on the block sphere? And you can see that it initially uh, um, follows the, the expected uh, one-half scaling and then uh, transitions uh, to the three-half scaling here for the later data points. So there's a, there's a transitional regime in which we uh, observe this transition from unitary to weakly interacting uh, uh, scaling. We can, we can further analyze this crossover regime, and, uh, and we do that by fitting our data with a generic function, which, which leaves the exponent here as a free parameter, and then we can actually see this transition from the, for, for, uh, for weak interactions, where we have the power law one-half, to the exponent three-half transition for stronger interactions. Similarly, we can see that, that, the, that the involved time scales uh, uh, progress from a time scale that is that is uh, typical typical for the for the weakly interacting regime to the unitarity limited regime exactly here, which then corresponds precisely to the um, spectral function that we started up with. So, I have uh, shown both the regime of interaction strength where only the two body processes were, pos were, were, were present. I've shown the regime where the uh, where a transition from the uh, weakly interacting two-body to the universal regime took place. And finally, uh, I want to show that at universality, so precisely on the Feshbach resonance, where no other um, uh, properties than the densities uh, play a role, only the universal regime can be, can be uh, uh, observed. And that is shown here. Now we sit exactly on the, on the Feshbach resonance. Um, and we expect this uh, power law to the three half scale. And that is indeed what we see for, initial, for, uh, for the initial decay here. Uh, we, we plot the theory on top of our data without any free parameters, and we see very nice agreement for the initial decay of the coherence um, um, uh, in this regime, confirming that we understand well what is going on at unitarity. However, we then enter, and that is the inter interesting part for us, and that's the time scale at which the polaron is created. We then enter directly into a regime of many particle physics, uh, and, and we describe this many particle physics by, by the T matrix formalism that um, was introduced by Richard Schmidt um, uh, yesterday, which gives us, in, in fact, this long tail of the evolution. And it's this T matrix which is the sort of lowest order approximation to the polaron in our case and confirms to us that we are actually witnessing here a transition from directly from, from, from universal uh, two-body physics to a many-body physics regime where the T matrix approximation is valid. And we interpret this at the onset of the Bose polaron at unitarity and you can immediately read off the time scale at which it's happened, which for our density is around the 10 microsecond scale. We, can, we have another parameter with which we can confirm this uh, observation, and that is, again, the speed at which the phase rotates. So initially, the phase uh, rotates um, 
uh, at, at a, 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 a rather low energy, which then progressively increases. And this, is, this uh, can be interpreted as, uh, interpreted as the instantaneous energy of the system. So essentially, as many particle systems takes place, this, this rotation of the phase speeds up, and it approaches exactly what we, what, as we expect, the polaron and the polaron energy as time progresses. And again, you can see the time scale matches well as we go from a two-body two-body unitary unitary regime to the polaronic regime. The time scale goes um, from zero to about 10 microseconds. So again, the energy approaches the both the polaron, and and we thereby witness the onset of, of polaronic behavior in our system. Altogether, this allows us to create a, a phase diagram of the Bose polaron, as shown here. Uh, on the x-axis, you have again the inverse interaction strength, zero being here, so this is unitarity. We limit our experiments and our understanding to the um, uh, attractive polaron. Um, and uh, and on the on the left hand side you have the time scale involved and you can now see the three regions which I have previously described. So we have a, at any given interaction strength first a universal behavior which is shown in dark green here in which we have this three halves power law scaling. And then we uh, depending on interaction strength we have the left half of the diagram which is weak interactions and the right half of the, of the diagram, which is strong interactions, and in the weakly interacting regime, we have a transition from the, from the, from the universal scaling to a weak two-body coupling dynamics, and then only at a later time, further on into, into a many-body physics regime. And whereas in the strongly interacting case, we have a direct transition from this two-body universal dynamics into the many-body regime, and the blue regime is where the polaron lives in our particular case. So in that sense, we can provide some input to other experiments um, based on basic scattering properties in our system, um, which at, on which time scale the, the, the both polaron forms and on which time we see transitions from these uh, two-body regimes into a many-body physics regime. And with that, I conclude. I, show, I hope I've shown you how we can spectroscopically detect the polaron. I hope I've shown you that we can interpret those results well with an appropriate line for shape function. And finally, that these Ramsey-type interferometric measurements will give us access to a full dynamical phase diagram of the polaron. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. Now we have time for questions. So maybe f first um, question on, on, on a detail. I saw that in the C of T graph at weak coupling, there appears to be some sort of dip or feature at 50 microsecond. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. You're talking about these data points. Right, yes. Is, Yes, is there I something special going on? There? No, I don't. I don't think so. I, this is preliminary data. We haven't finished this to the level of uh, of a um, publication yet. Uh, but I don't think that this is this is significant here. Okay. And then um, maybe, if if I may, what you expect if you now go to the re repulsive uh, branch? Ooh, that's a, that's a very different question because none of the theoretical approximations hold on the on the on the uh, repulsive side. So you plan to look at it? Yes, we plan to look at it. We've taken one data point, but it does not fit any of our expectations. So we, we have stayed away from the, from the repulsive polaron. That, that's even more exciting, yes. So, uh, my question is about the many impurities. Now you have in your experiment many impurities, and I think they need some time to communicate and maybe have an effective interaction. So I wonder where is this time scale? Because you have the time scale in which you form the polaron, but there should be also a time scale for which these impurities will talk to each other, and mm. maybe you will have effects on on the effective interaction. Yeah. But yeah. you have decoherence before, so yes, we have decoherence before in the sense that that if I go all the way back, you see that that for this observation of these mediated interactions, we are not in the most favorable situation, and the the reason for that being that the actual background scattering length in our case, that means the, 
the impurities would have to communicate through the medium, through the BEC, is very low. Mm -hmm. so, so we are in a, in a regime here, there is, a, there is one diagram here, you can see that while the, 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 the dashed green line allowing us to tune the impurity medium interaction strength uh, diverges and gives us the possibility to get very strong interactions, the blue line here is practically flat and lies very low. So it's a few, it's a few, board, a few tens of uh, Bohr radii scattering length, and that means it's very difficult for the medium to communicate any interactions here. So we're not in the optimal setting for mediated interaction to, uh, to be observed. Maybe a second question? No. The second question, uh, the last diagram, the phase diagram, mm -hmm. uh, can you show me, maybe? Yeah, sure. You have this two-body universal physics. The but in the case, maybe you have a different setup, like, uh, like the mass of the impurity quite different from the mass of the boson. Maybe you have also FEMOC effect, right? So this two-body universal dynamics is always there, or when you have maybe FEMOC physics, uh, this change? Yes, this could change due it to FEMOC physics. Okay. That would be very yeah. interesting, but we are, we are, again, in a setting yeah. where, where due to this low interaction of the medium, we don't see any, yeah. we don't have FEMOC physics playing any role. Actually, I should also, I, I forgot to flip to the last slide and, and acknowledge the team of experimentalists and theorists, including yourself, um, involved in the work at various stages. So, uh, going back to the graph in which you compare the experimental and simulated energy, so in the simulated one, at one point for positive uh, interaction strengths, there is a kind of splitting, no, the signal. Is this an artifact? Because this might, this might uh, um, suggest so I this don't is know, for the this density is, regions or, so, or so this is for the for the for the polar spectroscopy yes. is, is what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's we can we can take this diagram well, here no. as a as a no or you want uh, the, the actual the, the actual experimental the actual one. Experiments, okay. The experiments. The comparison between the experiments and theory. And the, so and the, the, the simulated uh, yes, in the simulated me. one there is this uh, splitting that apparently is not seen in the experiments. Uh, so it's not, uh, does it has a, a kind a, an origin or is an artifact of the uh, of the calculation so or indeed that there is a density region in which you don't... It don't is not entirely clear, in the sense uh. that, that the, the, theor the variational theory only takes two Bogliebov excitations along at the, at the moment. So then now it's covered by... <laughs> yes, now it's covered. Let me just flip. Ah, here we go. So, so the, the, the variational theory, um, I should acknowledge this, done by, done by Mira Parrish and Jesper Levinson, um, only takes... The, the, the impurity plus two bosonic excitations, two uh, Bogliebov excitations into account. And, and if you were to take more into account, that may actually fill this region here up in a, in a sort of uh, broadening sense. Uh, so, so we don't know exactly to which sense, in which sense this will broaden uh, or not, and that obviously makes a difference for the question whether this is observable or not in the experiment. We have tried quite hard. You can see that the, 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 the width of these uh, uh, lines here, corresponding to the density of data points we have taken varies vastly from this region out here to the one in here, where we've really tried to see whether we can resolve such a, such a, a, a dip here, which we couldn't. Okay, more questions? Okay. Um, <coughs> you may have said, said that, but uh, in the... Um, in the weekly corrected uh, case, you introduced uh, all kinds of artifacts due to the losses and the drift. Uh, were they also included when you went to the unitary limits? Uh, no, we didn't have to do that because at that point, the sort of uh, the, the time scale of the actual decay becomes so fast. That but even for the losses, uh, for some, well, let me. Uh, so we have to. I think the the only one which we had to include were the losses, um, but. Uh, where can we see that as a diagram here? Well, you can, you can, unfortunately it's covered up here, I don't know exactly why. So, so this is the only, the three-body loss process is the only process that remains fast at unitarity with respect to our, our measurements. And this was included, yes. Okay. And the exponential, is it something phenomenological or uh, the, the fact that you fit the, uh, the decay of the, uh, it was a contrast or something like this, with an exponential, exponential by your T divided by T loss? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, this, this, you mean this fit here? No, no, the, the, there's a term associated with the losses. Yes. Uh, with, which was exponential minus t divided by t loss. Uh, 
Yes, that was just that was just yes. We didn't we didn't we didn't we've previously solved the differential e equations that describe the three body loss in the two component process, and we've done that quite carefully. Um, but here we've done it phenomenological with an exponential. Uh, more questions? Okay, I have one small. Uh, in the case of uh, high concentration of impurities, uh, do you expect that uh, besides the interactions, uh, also the effects of quantum statistics of impurities can be visible or important? Yes, I, as soon as we uh, go to a sizable impurity fraction, we would move from this sort of impurity re region to uh, a mixture where quantum statistics of these of these uh, would play a significant role, yes. Okay. So I would eventually um, expect that other experiments in the field and also our previous spectroscopic experiments have shown that there were no significant differences between a 5 and 10% admixture. But I wouldn't dare to go much further than that in, in increasing the impurity concentration without having a much better understanding of the system. 